again. Welcome to Man's Talk. I'm Tammy Simmons. And I'm Carla Garrick. And thank you for tuning in. This is day, I don't know what, of whatever week. I think it's 40 days. I don't even know anymore. Um, it's a lot of weeks because it was mid-March and now we're approaching May because today is the 28th of April in case people are watching this at a delayed time. Um, so we're looking at six weeks of this. Um, before we start, I want to ask you a legitimate question because I find it different for other people. Do you, are you, like, is isolation for you an actual problem personally? Because I don't feel crazy isolated. Um, you know, I mean, I live a fairly, you know, I work from home right. life already. So it wasn't like I miss going to the office. Louie and I, in terms of our home life, are used to the dynamic of both of us being around. I think there's probably a bigger challenge for people who haven't done that. It's a little right. bit, I think, like when people go into retirement and then they're like, oh, oh my goodness, there's other persons here. And they're right. what are you life. doing in my space? That's right. Well, I just had a, I had a conversation this morning with Angel Bristol. For, um, and she was talking about isolation and I've noticed a couple different uh, friends that use the word isolation and how it's getting to them and I thought why is it that I don't feel that like why am I not having that anxiety I, I and think I, it's an age difference honestly and kids. more younger people and a lot of younger people who live alone so when they're oh, yeah. like actually stuck at home they're actually stuck right. at home and with Angel in particular she does have a kid and I did think about it and I was like oh I think if I had kids that's a whole nother layer of stress stressors at this point because like she was saying she is her child's playmate right now so that I, I i can see where if you're a parent in your home and you're not going out just as an adult you're not doing your normal adult things and then add the layer of having a kid at home that's depending on you to occupy them and, and i was like oh maybe there was a reason i didn't have any kids <laughs> Well, you know, so I think there's that, but then of course I've been, you know, out on the trails. That's certainly yeah. something, you know, some, we all know yeah. sunshine's good for us being outside, spring starting, all of that great stuff. So it has been really nice to see families out and about. Louis and I do trash pickups whenever we go yeah. out. And we're seeing a lot of like dads with their kids, yep. you know, young sons out, you know, sort of that age and group and, and gender that you don't always see. So I think that's a, a positive and that's hopefully something that we'll, we'll sort of keep around uh, with this new normal. Yeah. That I guess we're, we're just going to have, gonna be uh, you know, the, uh, uh, this, this controlled, you know, government manufactured lifestyle that we will the, now be Victoria has, um, Victoria Sullivan does a, um, a little Facebook Live every morning, which is brave on her part, because every time I watch it, I think, God, she looks awfully cleaned up <laughs> for that time in the morning. I'm like, oh, it takes me a longer, I have a lit slower start to the day, I guess. But um, yesterday she was talking about being home with her two boys and, you know, that it is a struggle. But she did have a good point. She said, you know, her ki kids grow up fast. And I mean, one of her kids goes to Trinity now. I mean, they're growing up quickly. And she said, you know, and a little selfish point, she kind of did, does like that she's getting this time, like slow down time to actually have this little time with her sons that she wouldn't have normally had to that degree. I mean, I love it. I really hope that there's a, if not a majority, but a good, uh, portion sub portion of granite staters who decide that remote learning might be a good choice mm. for them maybe there are some dynamic new ways we could figure out where you know it's 10 person classrooms at someone's house where yep. it's a tutor that kind of stuff because i do think your quality of living does improve when you're actually acting as a family unit to where the family is actually hanging out together again they're going out they're playing together they're having fun together and hopefully you know cooking meals together, maybe start that garden, you know, let's yep. talk victory gardens as we go into this new normal. I mean, that was your term. I don't like it at I, all. I know. I, I hate using, using the word normal. normal. I just at all. I don't think this is constitutional at all. I don't think any of this should be happening. That being set aside, let's focus on, you know, what could be good for, for families and changes that people can incorporate and say that, hey, you know what? This and this and this out yeah. of this experience was great, and I want to do more of this. And I mean, wouldn't it be nice, you know, people talk about the family and the, you know, and we watch, you know, like, you go back 
20 years or 30 years or however many years we have to go back, you know, when families just eat dinner together and, and how we've gotten away from that and kids are busy and everybody's got soccer practice and everybody's on their phone and all these different things. And this is kind of like almost a reset in, you know, if, you, if you're trying to look at the silver lining in the really bad stormy clouds is, um, you know, maybe some families find that they actually do enjoy having a homemade meal that maybe their kids or their spouse helped prepare and they sit down and eat and maybe that'll continue a little bit after you know where maybe people spend a little bit more time as a maybe they won't maybe everybody will just bounce back and go right back to what everything that they did six weeks ago you know i guess time will tell um talking about things to, we, we, we try to, we do, actually, Carla and I do have a little discussion ahead of time about some things we could talk about. We don't do crazy show prep, if you haven't noticed. We just get together and talk about things that, you know, matter to us, and then it tends, we hope that those are things that people matter, care about as well. Um, so I read an article today. So last week, uh, the judge at the New Hampshire, I don't know if it's Superior Court, Supreme Court, some judge somewhere decided that um, Donna Susi and Lou D'Alessandro and whatever other Democratic leaders um, that were suing Governor Sununu to spend the $1.25 um, billion that we got from the federal government in the CARES Act, um, they didn't think the governor should do it. They didn't think the governor had the authority to spend the money and that only these Democrats could spend the money. Um, the judge said, nope, Governor Sununu has the authority to do this. Um, so now it's funny to watch them put out what they still think he should spend the money on. And there was an article in the Union Leader today, and I found myself just thinking, can we just never let these people be in charge ever again? Because, you know, I'm not saying Republicans don't spend money stupidly also. But some of these things, I mean, Donna Susi thinks... Um, we should spend 20% of the CARES Act money filling holes in the state budget, which was kind of ironic because Sununu last week said he actually inquired about what the money could and couldn't be used for, because that's another problem. There's all these federal monies coming to different businesses and states, and nobody really knows what the criteria is. So the money that came from the CARES Act cannot be used to uh, fill revenue shortfalls or budget holes like you can't that's not what it is but it can be allocated and i believe this is something that governor sununu wants to do to backfill budgetary holes that he paid out yeah he borrowed money from peter and now we can put it back that's not really that's li that's a little so, bit so that's just that's just making something how it's supposed to be right. so that's just, not filling a different right. budgetary hole what susie is talking about is you know besides the fact let's just start with um there are these business taxes that oh, are supposed to kick in if uh if we uh, don't reach certain right. revenue targets right and that's a 12 percent tax increase yeah. that Democrats now want to put on the back of business owners and small business owners in this state. Right. Valentes, uh, Volinsky, they all fought for these tax, ta yep. tax hikes and they're going to want to do it. So if you are a small business owner who's already been hurt by being called non-essential mm -hmm. because they've told you exactly what they think about you, know that your taxes are about to go up well i mean in 12 12.5 12 percent across the board on all businesses is insane can you imagine that's on top of your normal taxes um i also just say the irony because i remember at the time when they were sort of writing this i looked at some of that language and i was like this is awful. Who's going to agree to this? And then the back channel language and the, the story that we were being told is this is this will never right. happen. So we're going to agree to it because this will never happen. Yep. So let me tell you another thing. If someone tells you this will never happen, don't agree to whatever it is right. because it's likely that something could happen, which is exactly what just happened. Yep. And I think, you know, if any Democrat wants to get reelected this November, they better not hike these taxes because I will tell you, I'm this far from a tax rule. Well, and, I mean, and like, like people, I don't think the average person realizes where money comes, where state funding, where state funding comes from. And when they promise things, you know, when we promise spending, 
that money has to come from someplace. So like, let just take Manchester. Well, I mean, now they just print it, right, Tammy? I, I mean, it just comes. We but just that's make only it the from federal the government can print it. The state can't print it. So, um, like no, Manchester. No, they just take their billions of magic money and then just dole it out to their friends. Um, what do we do in the city of Manchester when our rooms and meals tax money is diminished because it will be because if restaurants are you know closed and only carry out they've got we all know they have diminished sales um what are we going to do when other revenue sources are diminished because people maybe aren't registering their car or you know there's a lot of different things so it unfortunately um because the unions control most of our government expenses apparently we can't furlough union employees without permission from the union which is crazy that we're ever <laughs> approving a contract like that who, who works for whom here i mean that was literally what joyce craig said is oh you know we're sorry we can see you guys are mad we're kind of like doing yeah. you dirty but you know what toughies you're just gonna have to oh. eat it up because we can't actually furlough anyone because it'll cost us too much money because we have these sweetheart deals that gives everyone a golden handshake when they leave. So then today I read in the paper that Donna Susi of Manchester, one of your senators that people who are watching this back home are actually voting for, was like, you know who we should <laughs> give this money to? We should give it to the essential workers for hazardous pay and for retention pay but let's be very clear so the unions have already said hey we're in this special class of people who get these special above market salaries and all these above market benefits that are way more lucrative than any other one of us non-essential human beings can get in the free market and then they're like oh and you know what now that we have benefited this entire essential class of people we are now going to take this other money and we are going to give that money to the essential people as well. So well, if you are a non-essential taxpayer, I will tell you, if you are not mad as all get out for what is happening right now in this state, then you are not paying attention and you should be. Well, and, you know, talking about that money that Donna Susie's talking about, the um, so that, yeah, law enforcement, they think hazard law enforcement should get hazard pay, which is Weird they because law get enforcement, get all, they already get hazard pay. pay. And the reason we pay them as much as they do is because of the d type of job that they do. You know, that's what the, the basis of all of the other things we already pay them. But then I, my, so my political brain, when I saw it, because I thought it's weird that they're saying it should go to law enforcement, but they're not saying it should go to the firefighters, right? So then I thought, oh, but if I'm not mistaken, and I could be wrong because every once in a while I am. Was it Sununu endorsed by the police associations groups last time? So is this a bone by the Democrats to the police association to say, looky, looky here, we'll give you some public, we'll give you taxpayer money so that you'll like us and maybe you won't endorse Sununu this time. Yeah. I mean, always. you know, I mean, the, the, the law enforcement plays both sides. I think, you know, they have the Democrats and the Republicans equally in their pocket. Oh. So, I mean, so I would the other put them in an entirely different class, an entire violation to the New Hampshire Constitution, which is not supposed to create different classes of I people. Agree. But we know in the state of New Hampshire, we have done that. And those classes of people are the essentials, which are government employees who take your money, and then the rest of us. So one of the other bits... Um, from this pool of money, the way the Democrats would like to spend it, which I, I found myself saying, it, you're, you've got to be out of touch if you think this. They would like to use it to extend that $600 unemployment bonus beyond July 31st when the federal money will stop until the end of September. So they want to take money that was going to New Hampshire to help. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Apparently I dropped things um, to restart New Hampshire's economy and get us back to think. So naturally we should extend this unemployment boondoggle because it, 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 it was stupid to start. The federal government somehow stupid people there decided that a flat $600 added unemployment benefit was somehow a good thing. And 
in fairness, I can tell you. Too, we know that $600 is $15 an hour. It is part of the socialist takeover of our country. Well, they're trying to get people comfortable state. with it. And here's the thing. Look, there are 49 other states where people can go be socialist. Can right. we have one state, the live free or die state, by its very name, is uniquely New Hampshire. I do not understand why Governor Sununu had to stand with our socialist neighbors. He chose to do that. I hope he digs his way out of that. But the Democrats are, you know, they're just going to make it worse. I mean, let's just face it. It's going to get worse. It's going to get a lot worse. I mean, Tammy, honestly, I think we are going to go into a really I mean, beyond a really bad recession, I think we might be looking at things like food shortages. The food I think thing we is are very looking concerning. At things like not only record unemployment, but actually, you know, everyone's like, oh, we're going to come back and everyone's going to get their jobs. That is not what's going to happen. So I am surprised, actually, that the federal government's like, oh, we're going to stop those checks at the end of July, because I'd be very surprised if uh, President Trump wants a very angry electorate for those three months before November. Who knows? Maybe they postpone the elections. I don't know. Maybe we're just in like full-fledged authoritarian totalitarianism. You know, like, I'm like, let's get this party on the road, guys, so we can see where I really are. Thinking about, not that I'm saying I defend this, but I'm just saying, if the federal government really wanted to do, like, okay, so there's these $1,200 stimulus checks, right? Not that I agree with them, but at least those were going to people who were working, people who aren't working, like more across the board. Not everybody, don't get me wrong, but I'm just saying the $600 based on unemployment is just backwards. It's not like we're saying, here, Carla, you get $600 and Tammy gets $600 and so-and-so. Not, not that I think that's a sound policy either, but at least giving it the, the stimulus money went across the, you know, the, the spectrum of people working and not working, retired, not retired, and so on. This unemployment thing is crazy because you can see, I mean, in fairness, I'm on unemployment because I'm not going to go back to work for a couple weeks yet, and I get this crazy $600 bonus, which in my life, I turn around and spend locally, and I hire local contractors, and I buy restaurant food and things like that. But why are, why am I getting more money now on unemployment than I was when I was working? What that's backwards incentive. I mean, and and maybe for people back home, because I'm sure they can tell my frequency is kind of up here. No. One of the things that maybe might be useful for people to understand, right? So. So let's say, like, wh why not have a $15 an hour minimum wage, right? Not but everybody then needs why not have, like, $20, $20 an hour? Or why yep. not make it $100 an hour? So most people can actually understand that, okay, that number actually has to be tied, like, some kind of way to something. And that some kind of way to something is what value are you providing, right? So, you know, in the same way that people worry about if we have, uh, you know, if it's $15 an hour, do we then have a human cashier or do we start to go right. to automate, right? right? That question becomes a question across the board. So if people understand that there's a risk of automation, then people should also understand from an economic perspective that you can't magically decree numbers and then say that's how it's going to work and expect the actual economy to just work and flourish. So those of us who are saying, you know, we should reopen New Hampshire, maybe we took the wrong approach, maybe we should look at these economic things, are actually people who understand economics, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I don't think there's a Democrat that I've met, certainly. <laughs> there's not one progressive I've ever met who actually understands economics. And I think that's where the fundamental disconnect is coming in this conversation. And in some ways, this COVID-19 situation is going to, to, um, to show that, right? Because the debate to some extent now is on the one hand, but if it saves only one life, you know, I'm like, right. could that one life be Eric Gardner? Right. The scale of I numbers has to make by, sense. You know? And then the other people are saying, but you, you value economics above life. But I actually understand that life is economics. Like these two things are actually fully intertwined, which is why we see, for example, here in New Hampshire, we've had between 40 and 50% of hospitals have lost 
Yeah. They're employees that have now been furloughed because they stopped elective surgeries. Now, what is an elective surgery? People were like, oh, is that a boob job? It's not. It's cancer treatments. Yeah. It's um, knee replacement. You know, That's a common hip replacement. It's, right. it's basically any surgery that has to be scheduled. Right. So, yes, it includes a boob job, and it also includes grandma's cram cancer treatment, right? right. Or tumor removal or right. whatever, right? It's important. <laughs> And we've lost that. And I actually am very certain that that is part of the play to ensure that when we come out of this government manufactured economic crisis, we will have socialized medicine because the only parts of hospitals and the health system that have been kept open is the public health side, which means going forward, we're going to bail out those hospitals. And in that bailout, there's going to be a socialized takeover of our health care. So, you know, we could sit here and we could talk about all these things, but the reality is the prevention is worse than the cure and we are going to suffer under what happened right now based on faulty data probably for the next probably for my lifetime tammy i could be um i'm not sure i'm going to shift conversation just a little just because i we're, we're down to like five minutes on my stopwatch which means we might be have six or seven um i did want to get something on people's radar um not not as critical necessarily but it's still part of this process um there was an article in the paper, apparently there's an online petition to close Elm Street for the summer to vehicle traffic um, so that restaurants can um, use more outdoor space, which is ironic because Dan's been saying this all along. And on the surface, I was like, well, that would be kind of cool. And it, the, I think the petition was started by um, Peter McCone, who's from the Republic. So that's the guy who we see when we are able to actually have coffee work after these shows um but at first i thought that would be really cool when we go to miami i love that whole outdoor vibe thing um but then you have to stop and actually think how would this actually work and what are the other consequences because somebody else brought to my attention but there's businesses other than just restaurants on elm street and how would this negatively impact them and is that really fair um what do you do about you know like how do people get from point some people live on elm street live not the ones living on the sidewalk but like live in the buildings on elm street um you know and is it fair to say well now you live on a street that isn't open to traffic so you have to go park on side streets or you know drop off your groceries on side streets who knows what um so it is an interesting thing i and then part of me wonders if new if manchester would even have a long-term sustainable sustainable downtown vibe you know what i mean we're not portsmouth we don't portsmouth when you go to portsmouth even nashua just looks different has a different feel manchester just doesn't really have the same like it doesn't look like concord even concord you go down their little do main street and it looks inviting I don't think we've mastered that in Manchester. No, I mean, Hanover Street has where the yeah, palace okay. is, you yes. know, and, and they do close Hanover in the summer. I wouldn't be adverse to it, but I'm more interested in exploring the, the idea of what's fair. So I'm going to make a little video because <laughs> I watched this documentary once about, um, it was hot dog vendors in DC. And it was just some random yep. slash foodie kind of documentary that ended up being a very eye-opening learning experience in basic economics. So I'll just sketch the scenario. It ends up with, let's say, I don't know, 20 people in a room, right? So it's the city councilors, it's restaurant owners, it's food truck owners, it's this poor hot dog stand guy who the yeah. documentary is originally about. And so it's all these stakeholders. We might even call it a task force. Let's say like the reopen New Hampshire task force that we have now, whose calls I've been sitting in on. So now we close the state by decree. We're going to reopen it by committee. It's going to take too long, right? So in this documentary, they're all sitting around and everyone's trying to say what's fair. Now, what is fair to each one of those stakeholders is different, right? Yeah. Because like the food truck guy gets less business, but he has less overhead. So the restaurant guy thinks it's unfair because the restaurant guy has to pay, you know, property to taxes, taxes right. on his thing and whatever, right? So none of those stakeholders are going to have a fair outcome. But here's the thing, freedom 
And free markets is what makes things fair. So what happens is if every one of us can pick what we want and what works for us. So if they made it less hard maybe for restaurants to have things on the sidewalk, mm -hmm. instead of making that a special class and a special license and a different kind of regulatory thing, you know, we could just we could just let freedom work and then we could let every human being decide for themselves what they want to do. So if you want to buy a hot dog from the hot dog stand guy, you buy it from him. And if you want to pay $25 for the hot dog at the sit-in restaurant, you go do that. So I think we're looking at all of these solutions from the wrong way. Instead of looking at it from top down, we should be looking at it from bottom up. I don't disagree. Um, so yeah, it is kind of weird. It is, it, I mean, again, with the, I'm hoping that at least this is having conversations that are making people think about some of the ways government impacts uh, the nature of all of our lives, you know, can Republic, you know, can, does Republic have the ability to be outdoors? We both know that they can have like three little teeny tiny tables. Do I really want them to close the entire Elm Street? Maybe not. But what if, and I did say to Dan, never mind, the street is just disgusting. <laughs> I don't know if I want to eat on the street. And Dan goes, well, that would be part of the deal. You got to maintain your stretch in front of your building. But like, couldn't we, and I, it's funny. So then I'm, as you're talking, I'm thinking, couldn't we extend that seating area to include the parking space? Because that's a barrier. It still allows for traffic to go through. And they'd, they would make the downtown cleaner. And then I'm like, oh, and you know what the pushback will be? Well, but then the city will lose revenue from the parking meters. And I'm like, yeah, can we just stop? Can we just stop with all that? Um, so, that was my So own. on a positive note, also, yes. uh, one of the things I have been enjoying is um, I've been able to take some awesome classes online. I don't great. know if you've been taking advantage of this, but I did want to mention that um, the Naki Loeb Center, which is out here in Manchester, but it's a First Amendment uh, center that teaches people a lot about journalism, mm -hmm. like photojournalism, good ethics, what the First Amendment is, all of that. They have some classes coming up. I watched uh, one last week on Right to Know New Hampshire that was very interesting uh, and, and, you know, informative. There's one tomorrow, so for those, I'm not sure when this will go we'll out. But it we'll we'll get this on Facebook today, at least. You know, Wednesday the 29th, I think, or 20, whatever tomorrow is, sorry. The 20 something. It's, you know, melded together with this lockdown mentality. It is Tuesday the 28th today, so tomorrow is Wednesday the 29th. Wednesday the 29th. So uh, Gregory Sullivan, who's the First mm -hmm. Amendment, he teaches First Amendment law at UNH, but he's also the lawyer for the union leader, and he's been very instrumental in some of our big First Amendment cases here in New Hampshire. They're teaching a class starting at one o'clock and there's another class on Thursday as well that looked really good. So if people are interested, they can go to Naki Loeb. Um, I think it's .org, but it's N-A-C-K-E-Y and just look that up and register online for That's those awesome. classes. I think that'll be really cool. And then the Josiah Bartlett Center has a, um, has a, uh, a happy hour with PJ. Yes, Lord with PJ Lord Friday, Lord which Friday. I, I can't am wait. So excited for. So, like, he's one of my heroes. So yep. I'm going to be like, please be my friend. <laughs> Dan's taking the afternoon off from work just to watch it. Um, awesome. But those are both great organizations providing great things at this time. Um, not that I they're providing a, necessarily great things, but nheconomy.com is where if you want to read about the different presentations on this reopening task force or there's all the governor's orders or I found that it is actually a good collective of information of things pertaining to this whole shutdown um nheconomy.com there is a place there where you can send feedback to um that's all we got for this week because we're out of time again um it's supposed to be good weather get out there i went to the audubon um, center in mass on massapisic this weekend it was wonderful not too many people from out of state um get out take a walk enjoy your family and carla and i will come back next week and fill your life with joy again bye take care guys <laughs>